No matter how long you've been gardening, we all seem to have at least one plant that we just cannot seem to grow, whether it's our environment, pests, or not picking the right variety. These are a few of the most common veggies that people seem to struggle with. However, there are some less popular plants that can be secret powerhouses in your garden. If the plants that give you the hardest time are not on this list, comment below with your white whale and I will do a part two if I can. Number one is broccoli and cauliflower. It can be surprisingly difficult to get anything that even resembles what you see in the grocery store in your home garden. And that's because these plants are pretty particular when it comes to their growing conditions, especially when it comes to temperature and space. And they often will do this thing called buttoning where they just grow a really tiny little head and call it a day because they're so stressed out. The easier alternative to head broccoli is mini broccoli and leaf broccoli. And there are a lot of different varieties of this. Broccolini, Gailan, and Broccoli Rob are some of the more common ones. These plants are amazing for so many reasons. They are a little more heat tolerant. They are faster to mature. They don't require as much space to get a successful harvest. And in my opinion, they even taste better. And instead of getting one big harvest, which is actually really small, a broccoli head is only this big and the plants are huge. You also get multiple harvests over the course of a few weeks, and so you don't really have to worry about succession planting or anything like that. For cauliflower, you might try something called sweet stem or green stem cauliflower. It performs a little bit better in hot weather, and it is supposed to be a lot more tender and sweet than regular cauliflower. Number two is bell peppers. Homegrown bell peppers are notoriously difficult to get a good harvest out of. They're either super small or there's just a handful of them on the plant. And I see a lot of people struggle with blossom end rot with these as well. Corno di Toro peppers, however, also known as Italian frying peppers, are better than bell peppers in almost every way. At first glance, some people assume that they are spicier than bell peppers because of their shape, but they're actually sweeter than bell peppers. The plants are super productive and the peppers of the themselves are nice and large. I had a few that were almost double the size of the bell peppers in my garden, even with only six hours of sun. Number three and four is celery and spinach, and I've combined these because there's one plant that can kind of take the place of both of them. Celery takes a crazy amount of time to grow, and its ancestors are from marshes and wetlands, so it needs constant moisture in a way that the rest of your garden really doesn't. And if the conditions aren't really right for celery, you can end up with super bitter, salty, stringy stalks. And when it's like 140 days to maturity, that is really disappointing. And the main problem that people have with spinach is that it bolts so quickly. Most varieties are not just sensitive to temperature, they are also sensitive to day length. So even if your temperatures aren't raising that high, if your days are getting longer, that will initiate bolting. You can swap both of these out for something that is much easier to grow, and that is Swiss chard. Swiss chard is amazing. It can handle both cold and heat without turning excessively bitter. You can use the leaves very similar to how you would use spinach and the stalks are pretty similar to celery. They just have a slight beet flavor. Some people are able to grow these all the way from spring until their first frost in the fall, just coming through every week or 10 days and harvesting the outer leaves. The only downside is that celery does have, of course, a super specific flavor profile and a lot of foods are just not right without that. Like I would never use Swiss chard in a potato salad. So if you're looking for the specific flavor of celery, there are two herbs that you can grow that basically do the same thing. One is cutting celery, also known as leaf celery, and lovage is the other one. It has a celery flavor with a slight anise flavor, and a little really goes a long way with that one. One more amazing substitute for spinach that produces all summer long is sweet potato leaves. They are completely unbothered by pests in most regions, and you get sweet potatoes at the end too. Number five is carrots. Even if you get past germination, which can be its own challenge, if you're growing in soil that is dense, heavy, clay, compacted, full of debris, it's gonna be really hard for you to get nice carrots. That big taproot needs to be able to cut through the soil like a knife through hot butter. So while you're working on your soil quality, you might wanna try Parisian carrots. These are a really fun option because you just need a couple inches of soil. They're really cute and they have a more interesting flavor than your typical carrot. It's kind of nutty and herbal. Number six is squash. I hear about people People getting discouraged and demotivated by squash more than almost any other plant in the garden. And maybe that's because we're told how easy it is to grow, like don't leave your car unlocked in the summer or you're gonna come back and find zucchini. And these show up on lists of the easiest things to grow all the time. However, they can be incredible.
incredibly challenging and it mainly comes down to three problems, squash vine borer, squash bugs, and powdery mildew. If you felt your blood pressure rise at the mention of any one of those, I understand. Don't give up yet, I've got some suggestions and it all comes down to variety selection. So within the cucurbit genus, which includes melons, squash, cucumbers, a bunch of different things, you have several different species that have been cultivated. Plants that fall under cucurbita pepo tend to be a little bit more susceptible, especially to squash vine borer because it has hollow stems. This species unfortunately includes a lot of the classics. You've got zucchini, yellow squash, acorn squash, delicata, spaghetti squash, and some pumpkin. However, the cucurbita moscata species has solid, tough stems that are a lot harder for the squash vine borer to get into although of course not impossible. This includes all of the butternut squash including black futsu which is a Japanese type of butternut that looks kind of like a pumpkin and cheese squash which is basically just winter squash that looks like a cheese wheel. It also includes some lesser known summer squash varieties known as rampicante or trombuccino zucchini and Korean zucchini. These are going to grow on vines so they are going to take up more space. You can grow them over a trellis or you can take advantage of their ability to root in multiple places Places along those vines. So if one part of the plant does get completely wiped out, you might be able to save the rest of the plant. And for both of those varieties, if you don't harvest them when they're young, you can let them mature on the vine and harvest a delicious winter squash at the end. For powdery mildew, this is where choosing a hybrid instead of an heirloom variety can make a world of difference. Emerald Delight from Botanical Interests is a great example of this and most sites you can search by disease resistance and just make sure you've selected powdery mildew. First generation hybrids benefit from something called hybrid vigor, basically where the genetics of the parent plants can compensate for each other so you end up with a plant that has superior disease and pest resistance. One more strategy for dealing with these is to just plant varieties that are so vigorous that the pests can't keep up. Some examples include tatume squash, which is also known as calabacita, southeastern Asian varieties like taikan cob, and seminole pumpkin, which has a fascinating history that you should definitely go on a rabbit hole to learn about. Kusha squash are another great variety that tastes kind of like sweet potatoes that have been shown to have moderate resistance with squash vine borers, squash bugs, and powdery mildew. For number seven, we are going back to the brassica family. It's Brussels sprouts and cabbage. Brussels sprouts take quite a long time to grow and it can be difficult to give them the conditions that they need during that entire time. Cabbages can also be pretty sensitive and just won't ever form heads if they get too stressed out. These can both be pretty difficult to keep pests off of too because they are doing that wrapping and the pests can kind of burrow in there and you can't really do anything about it. Kale, however, is much easier to grow. You can have a huge yield if you use the cut and come again method where you're harvesting the outer five to seven leaves every week. And although, of course, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one substitute, kale can be used instead of cabbage or Brussels sprouts in a lot of recipes. If it's shaved Brussels sprouts or coleslaw or something like that, you can totally just use kale. One of my favorite companion planting strategies that I've ever tried is to grow kale trees you just keep harvesting and then eventually you have a very tall kale plant with some leaves sprouting at the top and all of this space underneath the kale plants is now open for something else. So I planted squash underneath the kale and the squash leaves helped to shade out the soil so that the kale never bolted and I just harvested an insane amount of kale from that bed. And if it's lacinato kale instead of curly kale, it is infinitely easier to clean and keep pests off of. That being said, if you really want to grow Brussels sprouts and cabbage and pests have been the reason that you haven't been successful so far, I have an experimental theory for you to try. It's based on something called the appropriate inappropriate landing theory. It basically says that herbivorous insects, pests, are finding their host plants through kind of a three-step process. One, they travel to the general area based on the smell. Two, they land on pretty much any green leaf in that area 
do a little taste test and see if it's the right one. And then three, they take a few short flights to neighboring plants to see if they're in a good area. And the insects have to make several appropriate landings in a row in order to initiate the egg laying process. So what's surprising about this is strong smelling plants that are often recommended as companion plants because they give off a really strong odor, like marigolds for example, really didn't do anything to disrupt the activity of these insects they just had more options of places to land that were not the correct plant. If it is green and just about the right shape, they are more likely to land on it, regardless of how it smells. If it is brown, they are less likely to land on it. My hypothesis based on that is what if you had red Brussels sprouts, red cabbage, surrounded by green plants of any kind. I don't expect a miracle, but I am really curious to see if this naturally reduces any pest pressure. And I have a link to the studies and documents that I'm talking about in the description if you wanna research more. I'll be back soon with more videos about how to plan your best garden. Until then, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.